altar of incense. Oh, go ahead. And you did. Good girl. Talking about the altar of incense and, um, you know, the point of this isn't just to rehash Old Testament trash. Is this going to go on all night? <laughs> it is to, uh, to know the Lord and to allow the Spirit of God to take things that were shadows then but that are meant to be realities in our life now and to work Christ in us, to work Christ crucified, to be formed in us so that his spirit and his nature can touch lives. And um, the first thing we want to talk about tonight is the materials of the altar of incense. And so I'm just going to read from Exodus 30. I'll read verse 1, verse 3, and then verse 7 and 8. <clears throat> you don't have to turn there. You just listen. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. Thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make it, make unto it a crown of gold round about. And Aaron shall burn therein sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps, meaning on the, on the candlestick, the golden candlestick. Um, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, at, at evening time, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout all your generations. All right. Um, so what we see is that the two main elements are wood and gold. And most of you know that, you know, that in the scriptures that wood represents humanity and gold represents deity. Okay, well, that, that becomes all, <coughs> of, of the, all that people get out of that. They just see it as that. They hear that. They hear that taught. And then they settle on that. And they never go any deeper. <coughs> And, um, and when I mean deeper, I mean to say to the Lord, Lord, how does this apply? And what is your understanding of this? And help me to uh, comprehend your heart, not just scriptures. Not just help me comprehend scriptures. Because we serve a living God and we want to know the Lord. We want to know him by the spirit, and we don't want to just be religious, and we don't want to just be Christian. We want to be after the Lord. We want to be hungry. We want to be pursuing him. And um, so it's easy, particularly in a, any sort of a teaching situation, to just listen to the teacher, nod when we understand something or agree with it, and if we don't, pass it off. And, you know, what we tend to do is, you know, my experience is that we, we pass it off as not true um, because we know something else. Uh, I learned when I was in Bible school not to do that, and I learned that because um, the Holy Spirit kept reprimanding me with my views and bringing me back to the Scripture and then opening his heart. Um, and then I saw these are not um, the, these are not Old Testament commandment scriptures. These are issues of God's heart, and He set all of that up with things that were were, were true to Him, that were dear to Him, that were of Him, that were out from Him, and that would bring us closer to Him in a real way. And um, so uh, let me just read a little bit here and then we can comment on it. The two primary elements of which the altar of incense consisted were wood and gold. The wood represented humanity, but in conjunction, conjunction with deity, gold. Scholars called Jesus the God-man because he was God come in the flesh. He was comprised of both. Some say that in heaven he was God, but he died as a man on the cross. However, and then here's, here's something I want you to just think about. And again, 
you don't have to agree with it, but to just think about maybe a little bit different view of where God shows up in this equation. Um, to see maybe if this might bear witness by the Holy Spirit. However, I believe that as a man, the Lord was wood, but in death we see God's true nature as lamb or as gold. Or in other words, okay, let me see if I can paint this picture here. <laughs> Um, it would be, um, if I could draw it up on the board here, it would be God up in heaven. And it is God in heaven sitting on the throne. But then, but then when he descends, he comes as a man. And that's the general teaching. So that when he goes to the cross, um, we see what is taught a bunch of the time is a submitted, obedient man to God. He came as a submitted, obedient man to God. And it's taught that he was the only one, the true picture, the true example of that. Um, but I believe that Jesus in his death, that it is there that we truly see God in nature. That at the cross we truly see God in nature. We see, okay, so let's describe the nature then. We see something that is not self-focused because he's dying for others. He is self-forgetting in the sense that he is not demanding his rights as God, right? I mean, and his, all of his rights and all of the, the things that would be due to God, respect and, you know, all the things that, that uh, anyone would assume that a God would, would expect from others, especially the people he created, how much more humans we would expect respect and honor and everything if we were of a higher... Um, whatever, status than um, people who are crucifying us. But instead, um, we see a lamb. We see one who is um, not only merciful, but not... Um, By, by his nature, not caught up in the circumstances of Pontius Pilate, you know, doing what he did, and the chief priest doing what they did, and then the people yelling crucify him doing what they did, and, and on and on and on. But rather, he's there as the Lamb of God, not just the Lamb, but the Lamb of God. And he's there for them. He's there for them. Okay. So what I'm, so my premise is that the cross actually isn't just an obedient man to God, the one, the only obedient man that ever truly was obedient to God, but that there we see the love of God. We see the nature of God. We see the deepest attributes of God that are more, that are more akin to who he is because God is love. He's not just loving um, and um, uh, and even even one of those stalwart things that people stand up for. Well, God is holy, and yet He became, as it were, unholy in looks and in judgment and in all of those things. Um, he became sin. He who knew no sin was made to be sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. In him, in him, only in him, always and forever in him. Uh, and so in 
in taking a longer look at the altar of incense or taking a longer look at the cross would back up from all of the teaching that we have, whether it be mine or anybody else's, we back up from that and we say, uh, Holy Spirit, help me not just to see that you were put to death just so I wouldn't go to hell. But there was something more. You wanted to be the express image of God. You wanted to be the, um, the clearest picture that was not a type at all, but was an actual third, uh, second person of the Trinity to demonstrate something that you want us to comprehend and to come into, um, but we can only do that in union with you. We only get that by union with you. And that begins with being in union with him in his death, and the scriptures speak much of that. Uh, being in union first in his death, and it's always first in his death. It's always first in his death. We were in union. We, we became in union with him, I believe, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he went to the cross, and then the scriptures in the New Testament declare <coughs> the most common that we would all grasp here, uh, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but as not I, Christ lives in me. And see that once we make that a theological statement, and we will do that, if we don't back up and start taking a look at the one on the, th on the cross that will be the one on the throne, because, you know, it says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, that's a slaughtered lamb. It says we have, in Ephesians, we have been raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, that's a slaughtered lamb. That is the lamb on the throne. That is the, the one who freely lost that we might gain. That's, that's just him. That's, that's the way he is. He doesn't get caught up in the circumstances because what's the scripture say in uh, Hebrews that he gave himself to the uttermost so that or that he can save us to the uttermost. So he doesn't get caught up in the details of life. I mean, you know, we, we can see that with Jesus. We would say, well, that'd be ridiculous for Jesus to get caught up in the in the issues of life going, well, I don't know if I want to die or I don't know if I want to you know, do this for those people, or I don't know, but, you know, all of the, all the things that could run through our minds, uh, we would look at Jesus and we would go, uh, well, he's God, you know, and I remember when I was young in the Lord and was, was hearing these things, uh, and I, someone, one of the teachers said something similar to what I just said, and I said, well, of course he can. I didn't say it out loud, but I, that's one of the few things I didn't say out loud. But uh, I, I, I said in myself, well, of course he can do all that stuff. He's the son of God. And the Holy Spirit, just as, you know, just, you know, wasn't an audible voice, but just as clear, said to me, who do you think I put in you? And I just went, you know, in other words, I'm supposed to be living by the Son of God. Of course, I can't do it. Of, of course, he can do it. He's the Son of God. Of course, I can't do it. I'm not the Son of God. Of course, it can be done through me because the Son of God lives in me, and I am a habitation of God through the Spirit. Does that make sense? And so... Um, so this, this thing of just seeing the, the gold and the wood, the, the nature of man and the nature of God, but not comprehending all of that in its proper place. Um, another thing that I remember the Lord saying to me when I was very young in the Lord, <clears throat> and he was talking about the cross, and he was talking about 
the way that uh, Jesus was in, in his nature and um, and he said to me um, you would never have known God in a real and substantive way if he hadn't have gone to the cross. That that's where you're going to know him best. <laughs> of course, I'm going, really? You know, that miracle is pretty cool. <laughs> He's going, that's not me. That's what I do. You know, that's like a, that's like a, a, a guy who's a carpenter and he makes beautiful, you know, things and whatever. And, he, and at home, he can be a brute. He can beat the heck out of his kids and his wife. He can be a horrible person. But we come into his showroom and go, oh, my God, you're such a creative, wonderful man with so much in you, you know. And, um, you know, I've heard musicians talking about people coming up to him and, you know, saying some stuff about them. And the person was admitting that he wasn't a very good person. He says, but, you know, they, they sit out there and listen to the music and they assume things based on, as it were, my hands and not my being. Okay, so uh, even so, um, you know, Yes, Jesus did miracles, and we can think wonderful things. But in the book of Revelation, it says they shall be de deceived by the miracles that are done, that the miracles will be the thing that makes them think that that's, they're really special, they're really of God, they're really this or that. Um, and, and again, always my disclaimer, I'm not against miracles and all that. Thank God for them. I mean, we live by them and need them and need the Lord's intervention in our lives not because really and truly we, we really need them, because what we really, really need is an increase of Christ in us. And then we can, we can face things without, um, without all the issues that go with it, which is true of all of us. I mean, we all have issues. There, there's no question about it. There, we all have issues that are going on, but the... Um, but the life that God uh, desires to impart to us, uh, I, I'm going to use a word that I've, I've been hesitating to use a bunch of words uh, for a while because they've been between me and the Lord. But this word is unconditional. We're familiar with unconditional love. But he's unconditional and wants us to be unconditional in everything, not just love. See, we, you know, we think we're doing good because we, we even talk about unconditional love, you know. But I mean, he, he is unconditional. It doesn't. In other words, here's what I mean: it doesn't matter about the conditions around us. He is who he is, and he was, and he is, and he is to come, and he will be. And that's him. And he's the first and the last. And he's the alpha and the omega. And he's the beginning and the end. And this is him. And this is, he's not going to change, you know. I mean, even if there was one time Jesus said, look, Peter, you're an idiot. Stop always doing this. But he's, he doesn't go there. Okay. So we say, well, you know, again, our first thought is, well, that's impossible for me when our first thought should be his thought. Let this mind be in you. And here's what the Lord told me, and I'll end with this because we're just coming up on 20 minutes. Here's what he told me. Let, you know, the scripture says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, became a man, uh, in the form of a man became that and then made himself of no reputation and, you know, even all the way to the cross. 
And when I rehearsed that thought, let this mind be in you, the Holy Spirit said, you won't let it. You won't let it. You resist it. You resist this mind. You, resi you don't res resist it as a theological concept. You don't resist it as a good teaching. In fact, you teach it. He said, you resist it on the basis of when it suits you. When it suits you, you won't let it. He says, he said, there's no need praying for it when you won't let it be in you. And that was an eye opener because let is a yielding type word, but, it, but it, that put it in a different context. That put it in a new light. Let this mind be in you means, okay, at this moment, let that mind be your mind. And if you'll just let it, it will be. But if you resist it and see, now I can't go on, we need to, we need to quit, but um, um, our resistance is not always, we're not always aware of it. It is, but there's a general resistance that rises, especially in circumstances that we would not want that mind, we would not want to let that mind be in us. Does that make sense? <laughs> anyway, good, good note to end on, huh? Everybody happy? <laughs> All right, well, let's take a break and we'll come back. <laughs>